Welcome to the House Committee on Corporations. Today is Tuesday, March 26, 2024. We are in room 101 of the State House. Will the clerk please call the roll? Chairman Solomon. Here. Chris Chair O'Brien. Second, Second Vice Chair Caldwell. Here. Chairman Casey. Here. Representative DeSimone. Here. Representative Finkelman. Here. Speak for Tim Kennedy. Representative McGaw. Representative Newberry. Here. Representative Phillips. Representative Quattrochi. Representative Sanchez. Here. Chairwoman Serpa. Representative Vos. Here. Chairman, we have a quorum to begin. All right, we have many bills on the calendar here today. Um, the, first bill, the first bill that we have is House Bill 7606 by Representative Handy. This would prevent insurance companies from treating widowed persons differently than married persons when establishing or maintaining an insurance rate or classification. Um, is there a motion for passage? So moved. Made by Vice Chair Caldwell, seconded by Representative Finkelman. Any discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Chairman Solomon. Yes. Second Vice Chair Caldwell. Aye. Representative DeSimone. Yes. Representative Finkelman. Yes. Representative Newberry. Yes. Representative Potter. Aye. Representative Sanchez. Yes. Representative Vos. Yes. Chairman, the motion passes eight to zero. All right, that bill passes. Next we have House Bill 8042 by Representative Newberry. It's an uh, act to vacate the forfeiture or revocation of the Charter of New England Racing Fuel Incorporated. There are no witnesses. Is there a motion for passage? So moved. Second. Made by Representative uh, Finkelman, seconded by Representative Newberry. Any discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Chairman Solomon. Yes. Second Vice Chair Caldwell. Aye. Representative DeSimone. Yes. Representative Finkelman. Yes. Representative Newberry. Yes. Representative Potter. Aye. Representative Sanchez. Yes. Representative Vos. Yes. Chairman, the motion passes 8 to 0. All right, so before the committee starts hearing testimony on the bills on today's agenda, I'm going to ask for a motion to hold the bills for further study. So moved. Made Second. by Representative Potter, seconded by Representative Finkelman. I'd like to remind the committee that a vote in favor of holding all bills for further study is not substantive and does not signify any position on the merits of the bills. This motion is procedural only and simply allows the committee sufficient time to review both verbal and written testimony and to organize the hearing process. So it's moved and seconded. All, the, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those nay, the ayes have it. All right, so we're going to go first to we have uh, Chairman McNamara's bill, 7069, regarding the Rhode Island Commerce Corporation. Uh, Welcome, Chairman McNamara. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, House Bill 7069 would require that the seven directors of the airport corporation be one of the seven directors would be appointed by the mayor of the city of Warwick. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, this bill uh, will bring back the structure that the airport corporation initially had when it was incorporated uh, at some point after uh, Governor Sunland's administration, the representative of for Warwick on the airport corporation was removed. Uh, and for those folks who aren't familiar with Warwick, I always say when you go to Warwick from one end to the other, you are always driving around the airport. To get there, you have to drive around the airport. It's in the middle of our city. It is a partnership that we have. It's a, we realize it's a strong partnership. Uh, it's an economic driver for our state and it requires that we work together to maintain it. And this one appointment by the mayor of the city of Warwick, who uh, Mayor Picosi joins me today, uh, would give us the representation that we previously had, and I believe make the airport corporation more successful. Um, we have a resolution from the Warwick City Council in support of this legislation. And also, I have looked at the separation of powers argument that some may mistakenly have. I was here, and for anyone that thinks that this is a violation of that, please read Patrick Conley's separate but not equal history of the separation of powers in the United States and here in Rhode Island. The separation of powers amendment states that no representative or their appointee 
may be on a board with an executive function. This isn't even close. And yesterday I ran into one of our greatest uh, retired Supreme Court justices while I was shopping at Dave's Market, and he said, Representative, you are 100% correct. So if anyone comes forward and says this is a separation of powers, please tell them to call me, give them my cell phone number, because it is totally, totally incorrect. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would be open for questions and appreciate your support. And Questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, thank you. Speaker Pro Tem Kennedy, would you like your votes recorded on the affirmative? Yes. So ordered. And to also hold the, uh, the bills for their study. So ordered. All right, Mayor Picozzi, I see that you're sitting up there, so I assume you're signed up to testify? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay, and is there anyone else who needs to sign up to testify? Because I saw a couple of other people, Representative Tim Howe. Councilman Howe is also here. Hi, Councilman Howe. Okay. Mayor, welcome. Well, thank you. First, I'd like to um, thank uh, Representative McNamara for bringing this forward for us, um, and Chairman Solomon and all the work delegation who have co-sponsored it. Um, the airport corporation is very important to the state and the city of Warwick, to both our economies, and we're very supportive of it. However, we feel that um, Warwick needs a voice there on the board. I'm sure a lot of you are aware of the recent back and forth we've had. Um, the airport corporation, they try to make that airport successful and they need to, but sometimes they need someone to, to tell them to keep Warwick in mind. Uh, they're a great neighbor for the most part, but um, there has to be someone there saying, what about the residents? The, the airport um, has 1,200 acres right in the center of Warwick. Everything they do affects someone in some way. We're the building the cargo facility, which I support wholeheartedly. That's the future right now. Um, it's right where a neighborhood is. They were going forward with plans that um, it, it, for, it was going to hurt the traffic in Warwick. Uh, we ended up having a, a long disagreement that we actually resolved. I've established a great relationship with the um, chairman, John Savage. Um, but going forward, someone always needs to be in that room reminding them about Warwick, what Warwick needs, and what's best for Warwick and the success of the airport. And that's why we'd like to have a representative on the board. Questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you for being here to testify. Uh, Councilman Halner. Then I'll call him next. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councilman Howe. Welcome, Councilman. Thank you, Chairman. The red, if the red button is up, then it's on. Thank I you. apologize. <laughs> thank you, Chairman, and thank you to this committee for hearing this. Um, first of all, thank you, Representative McNamara, um, for sponsoring this. And, and So very simply, just to explain, within the airport, I represent Ward 3. Ward 3 is the donut, and if you will, the center of that donut is the airport. The airport is 1,000, approximately 1,200 acres of land. My ward is just over 3,600 acres of land. One third of my ward is an airport, an international airport that is growing and becoming successful. I want to reiterate what the mayor said. We want the airport to be successful. We didn't make the investment and we don't live next to something that we want to see fall to distress. With that said, it is also an airport that is adjacent right to communities. Um, Chairman, I know that you and I have had many conversations and many times in the past and in the present where we've talked about challenges that we face as a city dealing with an airport in our backyard. One of it, to have a voice, to be vested into this airport also means to have a voice vested for the city. Um, we're not against the airport, we're not against the success of the airport, and I have to reiterate that again and again and again. The airport, it can be a great partner. It's just we're asking for a seat at the table, literally a seat at the table with the uh, neighborhoods, um, speaking for the neighbors and the neighborhoods within that area. Uh, I think that the mayor and the representative spoke perfectly on the issue, so I am completing my statement now, and thank you. Thank you very much, Councilman. I believe there are a couple of questions We'll go first to Speaker Pro Tem Kennedy. So I understand you, you host 
the largest airport we have in the state? Yes, sir. Um, at the same time, Westerly has an airport, and the people are upset over clear-cutting of brush around that airport. Newport has an airport. North Central Airport exists. None of them have the opportunity to have a, a seat at the table, so to speak. Um, in advocating for this particular position to uh, uh, have the appointment by the mayor of the city of Warwick, are you going to be advocating for Westerly? Are you going to be advocating for Newport? Are you going to be advocating for North Central? Or are you only going to be advocating for Warwick? So I'm not sure if anybody else wants to come up. Mayor, do you want to come up and? I can't see your name tag. I apologize. Representative Kennedy. Uh, rep um, all they, those areas do have airports, but they're nowhere near the size and the no, traffic. No question about it. But they have no ability to have advocacy on their behalf today other than the legislators going to the airport corporation and speaking on their behalf. So if we're going to create a seat at the table for Warwick, shouldn't that seat also be there to advocate for the other airports around the state? No, I don't think so, because like I said, th this airport affects Warwick um, It's an ex extremely. Those airports are small airports, the clear cutting, those are issues we face too, and we, we do deal with it. Um, th they don't have the cargo, uh, 350,000 square foot cargo facility that's going to put hundreds of trucks on the street every day. It doesn't have the same effect on the quality of life in those areas. Well, I'm, I'm sure the people in some of those communities will be un unhappy to hear that that's how you feel about it, Mayor, that th they should not have any advocacy on their behalf. Well, I can't speak for them. I'm here advocating for my city. That's my job. And like I said, um, we, the airport is uh, a lot larger operation in Warwick. I mean, we have, the rep will tell you how many constituents he has complaining about the airplanes going over, um, the fuel, the fumes. They just don't have that size of an operation in the smaller airports. Representative Sanchez. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, a, a couple, a comment and a question, uh, Mayor and Representative. Uh, by the way, I'm all for uh, whatever you guys want to push for. Uh, you have my support. I'm, I'll be voting yes for this if this was to get a vote. Um, uh, and, and to mention to Representative Kennedy's uh, specific question and comments, I think just to solve the problem, we could amend the bill to include all all airports have a say at the table when it comes to uh, appointing someone. I don't think there's an issue. Should, there should be an issue with that. If, if, if Warwick wants that, we should give Warwick what they want. You know, and, and I think we need to be putting the people of Rhode Island first uh, and your constituents and your communities. Uh, I think, uh, you know, th th these big corporations often like to think that they're doing us a huge favor by uh, providing employment, by giving us services, this and that, but in reality, uh, it, it, it comes sometimes at the, uh, no, it comes oftentimes at the cost of taxpayers. So uh, all Rhode Island communities and all constituents and residents and, and surrounding areas here in the region uh, would, would, would benefit from this. Uh, just curious to see what the pushback, uh, or if there's someone here in opposition representing the Rhode Island Airport Corporation uh, towards this bill. I don't have, I don't see a big problem as to see why the mayor's request would be uh, something to be a barrier to. So uh, I'm just curious to see what their concerns are, what their pushback is, and to, to, to listen, just to listen. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to reply to Representative Kennedy's uh, hypothetical. Representative Kennedy, uh, approximately four or five years ago, and this is an example of what a Rhode Island community resident could do. I went out to your Westerly Airport and we had a hearing on a study commission relating to airports. And Representative Kennedy, what I found during that hearing is that the issues that were brought up in Westerly, particularly relating to the trees at the end of the runway, clear cuts, airports intruding on a community, noise issues, those issues were very similar to the issues that Warwick deals with every day. And 
as a community resident focused on representing the people who live in the airport communities and picked by the mayor with that specific mission, they would be beneficial to all of the airports in Smithfield and Newport because they would be focused on the residential issues relating to airport travel. So, so Chairman, that's what I was trying to get the mayor to acknowledge, but the mayor did not say that. The mayor believes this person should only represent Warwick. You, as the sponsor, are telling me that person should represent um, all uh, communities that have airports. That person would be prepared for that and would be beneficial for all of the residential communities in the state due to the experience. So I think you would, to answer your question, I think you would have an advocate in that position. Thank you. Representative Kennedy, actually all members of RIAC should represent the whole state. And, and, and I think they do, they do well. As I said, they're very focused on, and they're very successful at making that airport successful. And we all need that. I'm just saying that sometimes they need a reminder that there are other issues they have to look at. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. And that concludes the hearing on House Bill 7069. Next, we're going to go to represent uh, Leader Chippendale's Bill 7946. Representative McGall, would you like your votes recorded in the affirm affirmative? So ordered. Thank you, Chairman. Welcome back. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Uh, this bill here is simple in its current form here. Um, 7946. It is seeking to extend um, a uh, date of execution um, from, I believe, 2026 to 2034. Uh, I'm going to spare the committee the long version of the bill uh, that, that put this into place. Um, but this will impact the only commercial uh, egg production uh, farm in the state of Rhode Island, which happens to reside in my town. It also happens to be the biggest employer in my town. Um, when this, when, when a, the bill uh, that caused this um, um, deadline to, to, to be created um, was before the legislature for a number of years, you heard the long form argument that I offered. Um, you heard uh, both my pleas for uh, the impact on employment it will have on not just my town but the entire state, uh, the cost it will have, uh, the impact on cost it will have, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you heard my uh, extremely eloquent arguments uh, regarding the uh, uh, the fact that egg laying hens in in these types of facilities um, are actually healthier than, than free range hens in the long uh, in the long run, and that was backed up by uh, our state veterinarian as well as other professionals uh, across the years. Uh, it's a very sensitive topic, uh, this egg laying hen uh, cage bill, um, because folks naturally want to make sure that we're treating animals uh, appropriately, and 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 that's something that we should be focused on. Uh, in this case here, you know. We're talking about a practice, again, that, that has been uh, going on. It's a multi-generational farm. Uh, converting, you'll hear that, you know, they just need to convert to the new standards. Well, like everything else the government touches, the new standards are too expensive, cost prohibitive, and won't uh, result in, in really any, any sort of a uh, viable business model for this family farm. They've been trying to diver uh, diversify their offerings into other areas outside of uh, egg production. Um, but clearly aren't able to do what they have to do in order to maintain uh, their status as the number one employer in the town, uh, again, that I represent. Uh, that's about the ex extent of this bill. Questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, thank, thank you, very you very much for your testimony. Um, Henry Wright from the Har uh, Rhode Island Farm Bureau is signed up in favor, not testifying. And Stephanie Harris from ALDLF signed up against, not testifying, and I know we received a lot of written testimony and emails on this bill as well, which uh, remind all the uh, witnesses and everybody that uh, all that, all those uh, committee documents, emails, and 
letters that are submitted, those are posted online for everyone to see on the bill. So with that, that concludes the hearing on that bill. Uh, Bob, on which bill? 7496? I think I see it. Bob, if you want to come up. Hi, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm here this afternoon on behalf of um, the United States Humane uh, Society. They were a primary advocate for this bill. Uh, I think most of the committee was duly elected at the time this bill was passed, the original bill and at that time um, it was the farmer was given eight years to come into compliance uh, that was a very long time done nothing to try to come into compliance but to defy the assembly and come back and ask the, the conditions that this bill were aimed at are horrific for the hens the cages are so small they can't spread their wings they can't stand up they can't turn around and that's their entire life this is looking, this is a, a wave of the future, and after eight years with no attempt to comply or conform to the legislative uh, process, uh, he's here asking for another 10 years. Uh, I strongly urge uh, the committee not to pass this measure. Questions for Bob? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony, Bob. So that concludes the hearing on House Bill 7946. Next, we're gonna go to Representative Newberry's Bill 7943. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If uh, you wouldn't mind, just one witness signed up. I'd like to ask her to call. To sure. Kim up. McCarthy. So I put this bill. Uh, Ms. McCarthy is an old colleague of mine. She came to me at the beginning of the session with an idea regarding auto leasing, and this bill results from that. I'd like you to, if you could explain what it does. Absolutely. Welcome. Is that red button up? Is it on now? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, so the point of this bill is to provide a common sense disclosure to let consumers make informed decisions about whether to put money down on an auto lease. Um, this is born out of, it's not something that will benefit me, but it's born out of my own experience. Several years ago, my son bought his very first car. Um, he traded in the car I had given him as a um, gift for his high school graduation, and I loaned him a few thousand dollars to reduce the amount he financed and um, as recommended to him by the dealership. Three weeks later, he was on Route 146 and he got um, slammed in the back, forced off the road, his car was totaled. It was definitely the other driver's fault. Everyone agreed the car was totaled. They agreed on the fair market value. And so I thought even though this was a problem, it was at least a fixable problem until the leasing company said that um, they were going to take the entire fair market value insurance proceeds and give my son nothing even though they had financed about ten thousand dollars less than what we had um, than what the car was worth and so i spent the next several months fighting with the insurance companies the auto leasing companies the dealership trying to figure out how could that could possibly be true. I was shocked, everyone I spoke with was shocked. The only people who weren't shocked were the dealership and the leasing company, both of whom said it was standard practice, that they'd never seen anybody get their money back. And despite the fact that the dealership had recommended to my son that he put money down, um, they said that they would never personally or recommend that any of their family put money down for that very reason. So, you know, I'm a lawyer. I'm a skeptic by nature, I'm also very cheap. There's no way, I read all those documents, there's no way that what I would have allowed my son to put that money down if it was clear from the information I received that there was a possibility he wouldn't get it back. Um, and so what this bill is supposed to do is put regular, oh, um, one more thing, so I fought with them for months, I got my son's money back. But not everybody has somebody who's a lawyer who's pissed off, pardon my French, and who is uh, sort of on retainer for free to go and fight with people for them, right? And so it's not fair that other Rhode Islanders have had to, feel, have to deal with this, um, lost their money. I'm sure a lot of them gave up. It's just not fair. And so what this bill would do is say that you can't call something money down or a down payment if that's not really what it is. If it's more like points on a mortgage, just say that's what it is. People might still do it, but at least they'll do it in an informed way. And that's, that's what this bill is for. Questions? Representative Finkelman. 
Did you get the money back from the dealership or the insurance carrier? The financing company, ultimately. They didn't even acknowledge me. They just sent me a check after I sent them several nasty letters. All right. Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. You. And that concludes the hearing on that bill. Next, we're going to go to Speaker Pro Tem Kennedy bill, uh, Kennedy's bill, 7712. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a simple bill. Um, this bill would <clears throat> designate the appropriate th authority on airspace issues as the president and CEO of the Rhode Island Airport Corporation and would align the certain ty uh, job titles with their proper responsibilities relative to aeronautics. The, um, in the old days, the Rhode Island Department of Transportation was responsible for the operations and maintenance uh, for the airport system here in the state of Rhode Island. Um, that was uh, superseded with the creation of the Airport Corporation in 1992. However, we have some archaic references uh, when it comes to the organizational structure that still utilizes the old Rhode Island Department of Transportation titles, which are no longer applicable based on the Rhode Island Airport Corporation's organizational structure. So H7712 will align the titles and the responsibilities throughout Rhode Island's general laws and clean up these references to reflect current Rhode Island Airport Corporation's titles and operations. I believe we passed this last year, uh, sent it to the Senate, um, and uh, it did not move forward from the Senate uh, towards the end of the session when things got bogged down. So uh, we're bringing it back again this year. Thank you. Questions for the sponsor? And we did pass this bill last year. I do remember that. Seeing none, that concludes the hearing on that bill. Next, we're going to go to... Go to Representative Knight's bill, House Bill 8040 regarding the Rhode Island Special Deposits Act. We have one witness, Patrick Guida. One second. Am I alive? Thank You're alive. You. <clears throat> Dear Chair Solomon, Vice Chair O'Brien, and Vice Chair Caldwell, members of the Rhode Island House Committee on Commerce, um, I'd like to first thank uh, sponsors of, of this bill. Um, it came up very quickly uh, for reasons that become apparent uh, when I deliver my remarks. Um, this is about House Bill 8040, which adopts the Uniform Special Deposits Act um, my name is Patrick Guida. I'm a legislative appointment of the Rhode Island General Assembly to the Uniform Law Commission. Recently served as chair of the ULC's drafting committee, which actually wrote uh, this Uniform Special Deposits Act. A copy of the act, as well as the other supporting materials, can be found uh, in the Uniform Law Commission's website, which is listed in your uh, materials, which I submitted. And there are a number of summary documents that were also submitted for your consideration, including, <coughs> in, in addition to my testimony, the testimony of Michael Weissman, one of the uh, uh, attorneys who was a co-reporter uh, for this act. There's also a brief two-page summary prepared by the Uniform Law Commission. There is a document described as why Rhode Island should adopt. There's a section-by-section -section summary of the act and a New York Law Journal article, which is just four pages and explains uh, why this is such a good idea uh, for banking uh, industry and their various customers, including consumer customers. Uh, the act is a result of a multi-year collaborative drafting effort uh, with input from leading experts in commercial law and the financial services industry. Uh, it provides clarity to an area which has been uncertain for a number of years. Special deposits are banking products that have different characteristics than other deposit accounts like checking or savings accounts. And one might think of this as devices in the nature of a protected escrow account. 
Special deposits are established for a particular purpose, and a beneficiary's entitlement to payment is determined only after a contingency that's identified in a written agreement has actually been found to occur, and that the bank, who is the depository institution, has confirmed that that contingency has occurred. The contingency could be the cl closing of a sale of real estate, uh, the distribution of funds to a class member after the court approves of a settlement of a class action, or the distribution of a commercial tenant security deposit when the leasehold ends. These special deposit accounts ensure that funds will be available to the person entitled to them in the future and that they won't somehow lose them through, uh, in effect, some misinterpretation of what's intended by the parties. Um, they serve an important function in commerce, commerce and industry. They're safer and more secure than regular deposits. Uh, you, all, you have safety and security provided by the fact that a bank is a regulated institution and perhaps by the deposit insurance. This adds another very important layer uh, onto that protection. Parties using the special deposit law can rely on the fact that when the contingency occurs, the money will be there to pay. For example, if there's a real estate closing, uh, the money's in a special deposit account. Uh, once the closing occurs and the property transfers, then at that point the contingency can be determined and the money will then be, uh, in effect, released uh, to, the, uh, to the seller. Um, there are times when uh, money's in one of these dep uh, depository accounts is either commingled or otherwise becomes subject to uh, uh, other interests uh, such as competing creditors. So while they're a vital component of our banking infrastructure, all these uncertainties have caused many to avoid using them over the course of the years, and they thwart the party's expectations to do what they're intended to do. Case law has, in the meantime, has analogized these special deposits to a trust, a bailment, or a custody arrangement and these characterizations are anachronistic in the context of modern banking and do not reflect how the special deposit is supposed to be used. So the act clarifies what it is. So under the act, a special deposit must be designated as such in a written account agreement governing the deposit. It has to be for the benefit of at least two beneficiaries denominated in money and for a permissible purpose identified in the written account agreement. And subject to this contingency I've been talking about, it's also specified in the agreement. The requirement that the special deposit serve a permissible pur purpose is a crucial feature of it and should be important to you. It prevents the special deposit from being used inappropriately for fraudulent or abusive purposes, for example, to hinder or defraud creditors. A permissible purpose is defined as a governmental, regulatory, commercial, charitable or testamentary objective of the party stated in the agreement. So it must uh, serve this permissible purpose, otherwise it's, it ceases to serve as a special deposit and loses the protection that the Act affords it. So the Act also clarifies the treatment of a special deposit in the event of a depositor's bankruptcy. Under the current law of most states, a depositor's rights in his bank account upon filing a bankruptcy proceeding become vulnerable to being drawn into the bankruptcy estate. Thus, an intended special deposit of the bankrupt depositor, without the benefit of the special deposit law, could be swept into the bankruptcy estate. And there have been two very recent cases um, in the federal district courts that have determined that this money that the landlord puts into an account intending to be special deposit, but really isn't, once there's a bankruptcy of that landlord, that bankruptcy pulls in all the money uh, of the tenants who have de actually deposited the money. So then the tenants become vulnerable to losing their security deposits because the depository institution's arrangement doesn't protect them. This law will prevent that from happening. Uh, the SALT law also protects against premature creditor process uh, once the money is actually in Patrick. the deposit account. So Patrick, uh, we do have your written testimony on this. You do. But yeah, so we have all your written testimony and all the committee members have received it. So um, I think we're probably Let me best. Just wrap up? Yeah, if you could wrap up. Uh, okay. A few points. Um, do look at the materials that I submitted. And I, I know that uh, this is dry stuff. And I appreciate that. Uh, but be aware of a couple things. First, this is a purely opt in statute. Nobody's required to use it. 
a bank could decide that this product is not something that they want to offer. It could, they could decide that they want to offer it in some circumstances and not in others. So there's, you know, there's complete discretion of the bank. The other thing that, that you need to know is that um, of the many bills that were authorized and that were, uh, in effect, put forward uh, as promulgated by the Uniform Law Commission this last year, of those many, this is the only one that was unanimously supported by every state in the country. Uh, they all agreed that this was a good idea and that it was uh, certainly worth enactment. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. So Patrick, if you were to support one bill from the Uniform Law Commission this year, would this be that bill? Uh, Tom Hemending would be very upset with me <laughs> if I said that. All right. Thank you. Are there any questions for Patrick? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank that you. concludes House Bill 8040. I'm going to go next to Representative Vos's bill, House Bill 7940. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, H7940, also known as the Senior Savings Protection Act. Uh, so this act would prohibit the charging of any fees to a senior citizen uh, defined as anyone 65 years age or older uh, on any hard copy, paper, bill, invoice, or statement. Uh, any violation of this provision would be a deceptive trade practice and be subject to a $500 fine. Uh, really what we're trying to do here is really trying to protect the senior citizens. Um, those who are not comfortable uh, or do not have internet access, we're trying to uh, essentially eliminate them from being penalized for growing up in a different era than what we're currently in. Um, also, I understand that the Rhode Island Bankers Association uh, requested an amendment for this. Uh, the bill here states that it would take, this bill would take place upon uh, passage. Uh, that being said, they requested uh, they requested a date of the end of third quarter this year, uh, which I'm amenable to, and I have no issue changing that and submitting a sub A for this. Uh, again, this is just simply a protection bill. We're, we're really just trying to, you know, not penalize senior citizens who do not have internet access or, or simply are not comfortable using the internet, whether it be a laptop uh, or a cell phone, to, to pay a bill. Um, so if there are any questions with that, I'd be happy to answer. Representative Vos, I think this is a great bill. I'm glad you introduced this. Are there any questions for Representative Vos? Representative Phillips. Just one quick question. I know he's sitting next to me. I could have talked to him <laughs> offhand, but this also includes the state itself, correct? Because the Rhode Island Bridge and Transit Authority, if you get a paper statement, they charge you a fee. I believe that would be correct. Uh, the language is pretty, excuse me, is this up? The language is pretty direct. There's really not any lawyer speak in this. Uh, it, it's pretty cut and dry. So if there's uh, anything that I'm missing in, in Title VI, which, which there very well may be, um, I, I can certainly check in on that with you. But uh, again, so the language that, that's added here, uh, it's very, you know, it's very direct. So I believe that would be the case. Yes. However, you know, I'd have to dig a little bit deeper um, into Title VI. Thank you, Chairman. All right, and that concludes the hearing on House Bill Seven Nine Four Zero. Um, so next, so next, we're going to go to House Bill Seven Nine Three Six and Seven Nine Three Seven by Representative Cotter. If you want to introduce both, and I believe you have one witness on both of those bills. Thank you very much, okay. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. I know how to use these, so let me turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, always a pleasure coming before you. Um, this, these two bills are very simple. They clarify the status of any disaster response worker being um, considered a state employee during their efforts. Um, as a disaster responder. I could go on. Do you want me to just let you? I think this is an important bill. Um, I think it's very important, both of these bills. I'm just going to touch two things, and then I'm going to let the expert do the talking. Um, Task Force 7, which my expert will talk about, is an, uh, the Rhode Island uh, Architects and Engineers um, uh, Emergency Response Task Force. And um, they've done some wonderful work uh, with Superstorm Sandy. 
And currently, Task Force 7 is standing down in the state of Rhode Island. So what does that mean? That means um, if we had a bridge collapse, the architects wouldn't come to, to fix it. Um, and I'm going to let the expert talk about why they wouldn't come. But given climate change, given all of the disasters we've seen in the last several years, I think it is incredibly important that we make it very easy for first responders to come and help us out. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my expert. Ken. Good evening, members of the, uh, the Corporations Committee and, and Chair Solomon. Um, my name is Kenneth Filarski. I'm a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and also a lead fellow of the U.S. Green Building Council. But I'm here today uh, representing my firm, Filarski Architecture and Planning and Research, and also as president and founder of the Rhode Island Architects and Engineers Emergency Response Task Force 7. Um, as, as the representative said, we're standing down right now, and, and this is the way this, these two bills came about, it's to solidify and clarify the, the fact that disaster responders, whether they're first or second responders, and whether they're disaster responders as true volunteers, um, be it architects or engineers, or other qualified professionals, are considered state employees when deployed in the event of a declared disaster. The, um, the, in, in my written testimony, there, uh, there highlighted the, what we did during Superstorm Sandy. We received a National Service Award from the American Institute of Architects and accommodation from the town of Westerly for the work that we did. And essentially, it's a numbers game. The, um, when, I'm also a disaster responder trainer and trainer of the trainers. I've trained over 1,000 architects and engineers as, a disaster, as disaster responders under the California Office of Emergency Services, um, California OES, which is a, basically the platinum standard for disaster responders. So um, right now, Task Force 7, as the representative stated, we're standing down, it means we will not respond to a disaster. And the reason being, there was an opinion that when we were uh, attempting to rewrite our memorandum of understanding with the Rhode Island Office of Emergency, uh, the Rhode Island Emergency Man Management Agency, the, uh, there was a, basically the Attorney General said back then, I think it was 2017, 2018, that we are not considered state employees. Uh, and that was relative to legal representation by the Attorney General. Uh, which is afforded to state employees under uh, it, the, the, the statute is stated there. So we're concerned about that. We're also concerned, concerned about the fact that it could also be extrapolated to, be, to mean that we're not state employees uh, under the current legislation or the current statutes for workers' compensation, death benefits, and, and others uh, as, as other state employees are. So basically that means we will not re respond, and architects and engineers from, uh, from other parts of the country or nearby states will not respond in a disaster situation. And as I said earlier, disasters are a numbers game. It takes a safety assessment team 15 to 20 minutes, if they really have their timing down, to assess each individual building and structure that has been damaged by the, the disaster, whether it's wildfire, flooding, hurricanes, whatnot. So if you have a, if you have a thousand structures that are that are uh, hit by, by by the disaster, we need numbers. We need bodies, and uh, the building officials are enough are, are are not enough. We responded very well in Sandy. We we're ready to respond again, but we we need to build up the ranks. I'm not able. To, I don't feel very comfortable in training new architects and engineers as disaster responders in Rhode Island because we have this blockage, so to speak, by the attorney general's opinion. So what, what the first bill in emergency management does is, is clarify, clarifies that disaster responders have all the benefits of state employees. And the second bill, um, 7937, re re clarifies the architecture portion of the general laws uh, to that same extent. So they both, they're both interrelated and they're both strategic and, and highly, highly important for the, the state and disaster response so that people can get back to their homes in their businesses and communities can get on with their work. So with that, I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony on both bills. So that concludes the hearing on House Bill 7936 and 7937. Next, we're going to go to 7941 by Representative Potter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, this bill is what I would define as a consumer protection bill. 
um, and it's really aimed at protecting very vulnerable people from a predatory practice, very similar to the uh, payday lending bill that this committee has heard in the House passed last year. But this is targeted at what is uh, colloquially known as a rent-a-bank scheme, which uh, effectively allows payday lending institutions to circumvent what the usury laws in our state are um, and charge really exorbitant interest rates on small loans by using out-of-state banks to underwrite the loan by applying the usury limits in that state, um, allegedly where the bank is located that is actually writing the loan. Uh, it does this by opting out of a federal act known as the Depository Institutions Deregulation and Monetary Control Act of 1980. Um, when this bill, when this federal act was written, it carved out a provision that allowed states to do so. And uh, the language that you read is very particular to enact that. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I know that we have uh, some people that are very well educated on the subject matter that are here to testify and answer any questions that the committee may have. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, we're gonna go to the witnesses. So we have Phil Goldsater, and Alan Krinsky. And while they're both coming up, Keith McGovern signed up in favor, not testifying. Will Farrell from Bankers Association signed up against, not testifying. Lynette Foy Menard from the Mortgage Bankers Association signed up against, not testifying. Michael Dumont from Citizen, uh, who is a citizen, signed up in favor, not testifying. Steve Alves and Bob Jacquard from Upstart signed up against not testifying. So we'll start off with Phil. If the red button is up, it's on. Okay, then I turn it off. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll save you the, the trouble of reading my testimony. We submitted it for the record, so you have it in front of you. I'll, I'll try and hit on just one or two points. So my name is Phil Goldfeder. Um, I served as a senior advisor to Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. I served in the New York State Legislature myself, and now I continue my public service as the CEO of the American FinTech Council. I want to be clear, oftentimes this bill and, and the idea of opting out of DIDMCA, DIDMCA, um, is, is presented as the payday lender bill, and how do we you know, prevent payday lenders? What I think we fail to recognize is that our association, the American FinTech Council, represents community banks, innovative community banks, online lenders that commit and do not lend above 36% right here in the state of Rhode Island. And so there is a tremendous access of safe, responsible, transparent lending options that are gonna come off the table. I think the intention of ending payday lending is, is a great one. We support that. We would work with you uh, to do that. We have worked together with legislatures in Illinois, in New Mexico, uh, working with New York and California and many other states to find ways to curb predatory lending. I think this is, Didmica is a very broad brush and a broad tool that will do more harm, not just to Rhode Island consumers, but also to Rhode Island community banks. Simply put, it's gonna put access to credit, um, at a, put access to credit at a diminished state here in, in, in Rhode Island. In addition, you'll find that a lot of people are gonna talk about Iowa, how it, it worked in Iowa, it was, it was done in Iowa in 1980. I can tell you that Iowa has lost a significant amount of value in economic development and consumer access because they opted out almost 40 years ago. And there's no statistics that you could show that will prove that this has been a success or somehow enabled access to credit while preventing predatory lenders in Iowa. I'll just end by saying, again, the next example people are going to use is Colorado. Well, Colorado last year introduced this bill. Um, it was set to take, uh, take effect and be implemented in July of this year, the opt-out, um, and a number of trade associations, including the American FinTech Council, um, have literally just yesterday brought uh, legal action against the state, um, contending that loans not made in Iowa, can, excuse me, in Colorado can't be regulated uh, in Colorado. Ultimately, what I would say is that there's a delta between what we're talking about in terms of curbing payday lending and a lot of the responsible innovators that the American FinTech Council represents. And, Obviously, happy to take any questions. Representative Potter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, two questions for you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for actually being here and answering questions from the committee, too. I appreciate it. Um, when you say that the council that you represent, none of your members lend in Rhode Island above 36%, that strikes me as saying that this wouldn't apply to you. So why are you here opposing it? 
the, the interest rates in Rhode Island today are not at a, at a, at a again, like I said, there's a broad tool, meaning if Rhode Island was, was introducing legislation that would limit lending at 36% and below, then we would be absolutely in support of it. We supported legislation in Illinois that did exactly that, that found kind of a middle ground. We supported legislation in New Mexico also that exempted um, anybody lending below 36%, which as you know, the Military Lending Act sort of is the nationally accepted um, interest rate that, that all the consumer groups will support as well. And so we, we work with consumer groups in Illinois um, to carve out uh, opp opp opportunities for our members, and we're hoping that we could do that here as well. I think this is a, a broad tool. So in summary, it would affect your members is what you're saying? It would affect our members because the interest rates for Rhode Island consumers today are below 36%. But what's interesting to note on this as well, this only affects state chartered banks. It won't impact credit cards in your pocket. It won't, credit, it won't affect sort of larger nationally chartered banks. And so what we're doing is we're, we're, we're Didmica was a, a, a mechanism to create parity for state chartered banks with their nationally chartered counterparts. All this bill does is sort of takes state chartered banks out of the equation and enables nationally chartered banks to continue to do what they're doing, but you've removed competition from the ecosystem. Thank you. So none of your members of the council are Rhode Island state chartered banks, correct? Correct. So this would prohibit your members who are out of state other charted in other states from lending to Rhode Island residents at an interest rate above what is legally allowed in Rhode Island, correct? Again, correct to 36%. And my last question, when you say that Iowa has been denied economic opportunity by prohibiting this, what kind of economic opportunity is spurred by lending to usually low-income people at very high interest rates? So I want to be clear about something, because oftentimes there's a confusion if, well, if you raise the interest rate level, automatically consumers are going to be charged more. It's not the way it works, right? Ultimately, it's risk-based. And so all you're doing is opening the door for a wider swath of consumers. Actually, responsible online lenders are creating access where traditional banks have long forgotten rural and minority communities. And so, it, it, again, it, it, the, the talking points are, are, are fantastic in terms of what we're trying to do, but you're limiting access. In a world where there's rising federal interest rates, right, all we're doing is squeezing out the middle class because as the Fed rates go up, you're, you're making credit harder and harder to access uh, here in the state of Rhode Island. Any other questions? Seeing none. Uh, before we move on, so Representative Phillips and Representative Casey, would you like your votes recorded in the affirmative? Please. Without objection, yes, please. So ordered. You may proceed. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Solomon, members of the committee. My name is Alan Krinsky. I'm the Director of Research and Fiscal Policy at the Economic Progress Institute. And I'm here today to find strong support of Representative Potter's H7, H, H7941, which will protect Rhode Islanders from some predatory lenders. Um, and I'd like to say that the, the bill is out to prevent a known harm. I don't know if we're talking about um, lenders that are not under the the American FinTech Council, but we are talking about what Rep. Potter referred to as the rent -a bank scheme. There are FinTech companies, um, we know of five of them we believe are operating in Rhode Island, charging Rhode Islanders interest rates between 100 and 225 percent. Um, these are online lenders rooted in the history of payday lending. They're not banks or credit unions and are not licensed to operate in Rhode Island as lenders or as any sort of financial institution. They like to pretend they're merely intermediaries arranging the loans, but they basically run the entire process from the application through collection. At one point in the middle of the process, they go to an out-of-state bank, often in Utah, which does not have an interest rate limit, and they have that bank sign off on the loan they then, right after that, buy the loan and pay a fee to the bank, which is why it's called the rent-a-bank. Um, so there are other issues around truth in lending, that basically these online lenders are really the, the lenders here, using these out-of-state banks. Um, and so the intent here, and, and that, that scheme works because of this 1980 federal act that allowed states to export their, state charter banks to export their interest rates to say Rhode Island banks. Um, it includes an opt-out provision that would allow Rhode Island to um, not permit that. And you know the difference here between say a $1,000 loan over 12 months at Rhode Island's limit for such a loan 
at 24%, it's about $135 to finance that $1,000. At 179%, that's over $1,200 to finance that loan. So um, again, I don't know about the community banks perhaps being resented here, but, but when we talk about access to affordable or responsible credit, I wouldn't call $1,200 on a $1,000 loan affordable or responsible credit that Rhode Islanders need. Uh, just we want to address a couple of arguments made by opponents of the bill. Um, they'll say it doesn't, don't pass it because it doesn't address the national banks. Um, it's true, it won't solve all problems, but it will address this known harm from the, the companies that are using the out-of-state chartered banks. Um, second, some points will try to persuade you, using a very creative reading of the federal law, that its opt-out provision doesn't say what it clearly says and that it only applies to Rhode Island banks. If we opt out, it only apply to Rhode Island banks um, um, working elsewhere. Um, and I think if that's true, then the legislation wouldn't even affect the, this rent-to-bank scheme and there would be no reason to oppose it. So I urge you to review the written testimony submitted to this committee by experts from the Consumer Federation of America, the National Consumer Law Center, and the Center for Responsible Lending. Their testimony will provide you with additional information and examples. Uh, I don't think there'll be horrible consequences from this legislation. The consequences would be protecting Rhode Islanders from these triple-digit interest rates. Um, and it will be negative consequences for the five fintech companies we know that are profiting off of Rhode Islanders by working this rent-to-bank scheme in our state. I'd be happy to answer any questions, whether now or at some time outside of the committee. Thank you. Great, any questions for Alan? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. And that concludes the hearing on House Bill 7941. Next, we're gonna to go to House Bill 7817 by Chairman Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is, uh, a bill that would um, create a legislative commission, a study commission whose purpose it would be to recommend legislative proposals to encourage a positive economic uh, environment for blockchain and cryptocurrency here in Rhode Island. Uh, we do have a, uh, a witness, uh, Mr. Vin Bono. Vin, if you could come forward. Um, thank you, uh, I'm done with my introduction. Vin will actually uh, do some testimony and then hear questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Vin, you may proceed. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, and I'd like to thank the sponsors, uh, Rep. Phillips and Rep. Casey, who are here that helped us sponsor this. My name is Vincent Bono. I'm a vice chair of the Rhode Island Blockchain Council. We're a 501c6 charitable organization. We're dedicated to um, educating and promoting the use of blockchain technology in commerce and in government. This particular bill that we, we um, helped craft, it addresses cryptocurrency and blockchain technology, but I'd like to address the, um, the kind of elephant in the, in the industry, which is that blockchain technology isn't synonymous with cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is the, uh, the revenue opportunity for organ private and public organizations. But blockchain technology is an, an example of a solution looking for a problem almost, where there's a tremendous opportunity to save paper, to have people's personal information readily available without having to you know, rely on government uh, resources that cost a lot of money to the taxpayers to maintain every, you know, on an annual basis. Um, one of our great examples is your uh, automotive title. You know, we don't have a digital title here in Rhode Island. Some states do. Digital titles today are basically, hey, the DMV keeps a copy of your title, and if you want it, we'll charge you to send you a piece of paper. Blockchain technology could um, avoid that. Um, on a uh, Secretary Tanner of the Commerce, uh, uh, Executive Office of Commerce submitted great testimony. She is personally a proponent of people's healthcare information being kept readily available on blockchain so that, you know, for example, people don't have to run to um, the hospital to get a copy of your MRI, you have it available, your doctor knows it's yours, but no one else has access. Um, those, are, those are just some of the examples that the technology could be used for. On the revenue opportunity, the cryptocurrency market is $2.5 trillion annually. The state of New York, which is supposedly cryptocurrency not friendly, collected close to $1.8 billion in non-tax fees regarding to cryptocurrency transactions. Uh, there were $9.36 billion in cryptocurrency gains in the state of California last year. The, uh, you know, the capital gains tax personally, I don't understand why it's not here in Rhode Island. You know, we're a geographically small state. We don't have a ton of uh, natural resources. We have great coastlines and clams. But, you know, it would be really nice to have that, uh, 
over almost a billion and a half dollars in our coffers and not some other states. So that being said, if anyone has any questions. Great. Questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, one item, um, I do have one of my colleagues that wasn't here. Uh, if there's, is there up. someone else who's here to testify on this bill? Yes. All right, if you want to step up to the microphone, identify yourself. Thank you all very much. Button up, button up. Is it on? Thank you, Chairman Solomon and uh, members of the committee for allowing me to testify. My name is Andre Herrera and I'm a proud Rhode Islander uh, standing before you in support of this blockchain legislation. I just wanted to present a few uh, different perspective on blockchain. Uh, the adoption rate of this technology is faster than the internet was in the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, in fact, the adoption curve is the fastest in human history. Despite this, not even 1% of the money in the world has been invested in digital assets yet. Some would argue that this is old technology. It's not. We're just beginning to scratch the surface of blockchain's potential, and we're just beginning to wrap our heads around this very big idea. Does everybody know how the stock market works, the intricacies and the nuances of the stock market? No, but a lot of people have faith in it. And right now, it's the same with blockchain technology. We need to have some faith in it right now and take a deep dive and study it and study its potential benefits for our state. And the two most important takeaways for blockchain is that the protocols keep developing, regardless of whether we participate or not, and there's exponential growth in the user base. It's taking off, and the proof is in the passage of time. And Rhode Island needs to capture this moment and be a leader in blockchain before we are left behind. So I strongly urge uh, the committee to consider this legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions for Andre? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. And that concludes the hearing on that bill. Uh, next, we're going to go to House Bill 7938 by Repre Chairwoman Beginski. This bill is in regard to athletic trainers. It would require athletic trainers to be trained when the use of EpiPens on or after January 1st, 2025. Athletic trainers would be required to be equipped with an EpiPen while performing duties of an athletic trainer. So with that, we have Sean Petrucci. I see Mark DeSisto signed up in favor, not testifying. Having a tough time reading the names, but two other individuals from RIOTA signed up in favor not testifying. You may proceed. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the, members of the committee for uh, allowing me to speak on, the, on behalf of this bill. My name is Sean Petrucci, and I'm an athletic trainer at the uh, North Kingstown High School. I'm also the assistant athletic director, um, and I'm speaking on behalf of uh, the Rhode Island Athletic Trainers Association as the governmental affairs co-chair. Um, and I'm speaking in uh, support of this bill. Um, this bill would require athletic trainers to be trained, equipped, and equipped with an EpiPen. Um, as athletic trainers and someone that has severe bee allergy myself, uh, my wife also has a, a, a shellfish allergy. This, uh, and someone that has a severe bee allergy myself, that requires an EpiPen to prevent anaphylaxis. This bill has a tremendous value and ability to increase student athletes' access to emergency medicine and chance of survival with anaphylactic uh, reactions. So. I'd really like to, you know, kind of bring forward why this is important. Um, I work with student athletes, mainly student athletes of high school age, teenagers. As we all know, we were all there once. They're very forgetful. They forget things all the time. When I'm working, I've run into athletes that have uh, known allergies and forget their EpiPens all the time. This happens with other things like uh, asthma inhalers, um, you know, diabetic issues. But we know that they are very forgetful, so this would help prevent that from happening. Uh, we don't, as athletic trainers, don't always carry the EpiPen for student athletes. They keep them on their own. They hold on to them on their own. If we had an, an EpiPen on hand that we could generally use for any student athlete that has an, epi, uh, an, an, an allergy that would require an EpiPen, this would be very useful. Also, any unknown allergies. Myself, I was stung by a bee in 2010. 
I was 23, 24 years old. I didn't know I had an allergy. Didn't think anything of it. I had been stung numerous times before that. Um, and I went into anaphylactic shock and ended up in the emergency room. Um, so this would help with any student athletes that don't know or don't have an EpiPen prescribed to them. Uh, also, some people with allergies think that it can be avoided. Myself, bee allergies can't really be avoided. Some people feel that um, food allergies, other things can be avoided, but that's not always the case. We don't know when an allergy or allergic reaction could strike. Um, an EpiPen is the best form and treatment for any type of allergic reaction that could result in anaphylactic shock. So I really want to stress that. This would really increase the availability in emergency medicine for student athletes. Um, and for a very insignificant cost, it would be less than $100 a year annually uh, for a school district. So it's not a significant cost whatsoever. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to welcome any questions. Representative Vos. So before I get to my question, I mean, I think this is a great bill. Like you said, the cost means absolutely nothing, and for you know an athletic trainer to have this on them and that could potentially save a life, uh, you know, I, I think it's a great idea. That being said, what would the training consist of? I, it, this, I, I thought that you know something like this would be pretty simple. The only thing that concerns would be what training is needed, you know, to, to use an EpiPen. Yeah, no, great question. Thank you very much. Um, so it really is not a lot of training. As an athletic trainer, we all are now, as of 2023, required to have a master's degree. So we're more than significantly educated on how to use and when to use an, an EpiPen. Um, could you repeat the last part of that one for me? So really, I just wanted to know the process of it. And I guess the only thing that would really concern the training. Right. Yeah, it's, so it's we, we, we don't, like, in addition to the education, we also do first aid training. Um, some of us, like myself, I train all of our coaches every season on CPR and first aid. There's no additional training other than that, which we have to maintain as athletic trainers annually anyways. So essentially the training is redundant. I just wanted to make sure that Correct. Yeah, something. there's no additional, uh, it's not really so much the training, because we already do that part. It's more so the ability to be able to carry it. Okay, great. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your thank testimony. You. That concludes the hearing on House Bill 7938. Next, we're going to go to House Bill 7935 by Representative Carson. This bill would make various amendments to the chapter creating the Newport and Bristol County Convention and Visitors Bureau. We have Evan Smith from Discover Newport. And Representative Quattrochi, would you like your votes recorded? Yes, please. Thank you. In the affirmative? So ordered. One vote, correct? And a hold for further study. Oh, yes. Yeah. Th yeah. So Thank ordered. You. Two bills. Chairman Solomon, Welcome. members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify here in front of you tonight. Um, as stated, my name is Evan Smith, president and CEO of a company called the Newport and Bristol County Convention and Visitors Bureau. We are a company, a tourism promotion agency that promotes the nine towns of Newport and Bristol County. Um, I celebrated my 34th anniversary this week of serving that organization. Um, the bill in front of you, 7935, is a cleanup of a cleanup bill. This bill passed the uh, House and Senate and was signed into law by the governor last year. Uh, the Law Revision Office reached out to us this summer. Um, uh, very helpful, pointed out some changes that had to be uh, made for this bill. Uh, so we appreciated their input. We went back and made the recommended changes on this bill. The only uh, significant uh, change that, that is not in the former bill is that we are adding a 19th board seat. Um, we are currently governed by an 18-member board. Um, and in the bill, there's, we're trying to create a seat for the Newport Tourism Marketing District, which is an alliance of 19 hotels that collect an assessment fee uh, for collective marketing of those said 19 hotels. Um, so I'll stop there. I'll be glad to answer any questions, but I'll summarize this by saying that uh, during the 34 years uh, of uh, operation in this organization, we've had multiple changes in structural governance over 34 years, as many organizations do, uh, and we endeavor to keep our state statute up to date and fresh 
Um, and so we went through a number of different changes as uh, 2005 with uh, separation of power, uh, 2008 when we merged with Newport and Bristol County. Uh, and so the, the purpose of this bill really was to clean it up, make it fresh, and make it relevant. Thank you. Questions for Evan? Representative Finkelman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here. Uh, the part about adding a Newport Tourism Marketing uh, District uh, member to the board. Yes. Do you think that takes away from the mission statement of supporting the seven additional communities um, that is part of the mission statement of the Discover Newport? So um, thank you for the question. The um, Newport Tourism Marketing District is um, affects only the hotels in Newport, and its assessment fees can only be used for those applications to promote those. The bed tax, which supports the Newport and Bristol County Convention and Visitors Bureau, goes to supporting all nine towns. So there's a separation of bank accounts for those two things. So, and recently I've actually looked on the Discover Newport page, and it seems to focus most heavily, which isn't overly surprising, on Newport itself, but towns like Jamestown, Warren, Bristol don't seem to get a lot of um, focus on the website. And I'm just wondering if we put more of the Newport focus that it may take away from the other surrounding communities. So um, in destination marketing, when you have destinations that represent multiple municipalities, uh, best practice is really to have filters on your websites um, so that a potential traveler can search by town. So on discovernewport.org, all businesses, uh, we're not a membership organization. We're entirely supported by the lodging tax for um, the side of the Convention and Visitors Bureau. So the um, all businesses within the nine towns uh, receive a number of free services, including free services on all of our listings. So if you sought to find a restaurant in Jamestown and you looked at our restaurants, you would see all the restaurants in nine towns. If you wanted to find a restaurant just in Jamestown, you could press the filter for restaurant Jamestown and just get that. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank that you for the opportunity. That concludes the hearing on that bill. Next, we're going to go to House Bill 7211 by Representative Alzanti. Thank you, Chairman um, and members of the committee. I'm here to discuss House Bill 7211, also known as the pay Payday Lending Bill. Last year, with the help of many of my colleagues, especially the help of Representative Lombardi, and for the last 14 years, we reintroduced this piece of legislation, repealing the predatory practice of payday lenders, or as some will call it, check cashing businesses. Last year, I said that this is a merry-go-round of poverty. While it looks like a lot of fun on the outside, you ultimately get sick after you get off the ride. This practice goes after many of the low-income families in communities like mine and many around our state, but you won't find them in the wealthiest cities and towns in Rhode Island. Cities like Woonsocket, Providence, and Cranston have put forth resolutions calling for the ending of these businesses. Last year, we were able to get this bill on the floor and with suggested amendments from Representative Kennedy, I wanna highlight that it passed with tripartisan legislation, with tripartisan support, Democrat, majority Republicans, and independent support. So why is repealing these businesses important for our state? Consumer protection, for one. Payday lending, payday loans often target vulnerable individuals who are in urgent need of cash, trapping them into a cycle of debt due to exorbitant interest rates and fees. Eliminating payday lending helps protect consumers from predatory lending practices and financial exploitations, mostly like our senior citizens who are on fixed income as well as um, low income uh, parents. Financial stability and better financial literacy. Payday loans are exuberant financial instability for borrowers, lending to long-term financial consequences such as bankrupt bankruptcy, floor closure, or evictions. By removing payday lending, individuals are less likely to fall into a debt, a debt, a debt 
spiral, uh, promoting financial well-being and stability for households and helping them use better, honest, and financially responsible, responsible institutions like credit unions in Rhode Island and capital good funds that we have here. Instead of relying on payday loans as a quick fix for financial emergencies, which ultimately turn into bigger emergencies, efforts can be directed towards promoting consumer financial education and alternative financial services that empower individuals to make informed financial decisions and build healthy financial habits for the long term. A few years ago, if some of you remember, uh, we passed financial literacy to be taught in our schools. This will ultimately help educate our state on finances, which is an important part of all of our lives. And finally, how is this helpful for public health? Research has linked payday lending to various negative health outcomes, including increased stress, anxiety, and depression among borrowers. Removing payday lending can contribute to improve public health by reducing the financial stress and mental health burden associated with unsustainable debt. Let us, let us get this bill back on the floor and pass both chambers so that we can continue to protect our communities when it comes to predatory practices. Thank you so much for your time and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Chairwoman Alzati? Seeing none, thank, thank you very much thank for your you testimony. So much. All right, so we're going to go to Alan Krinsky, William Staterman, and Carol Stewart. Welcome. We'll start off on my left hand side. So we'll start off with Carol. Thank you. Did I turn it the red button is up. It's on. Okay. Is that better? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate having the opportunity to talk with you all today. Um, I'm Carol Stewart from Purpose Financial. Um, I wanted to say that I heard your warning about keeping it short and wrapping up. So my testimony is going to be very short and concise this evening. Um, Purpose Financial is a South Carolina-based consumer lending company in operation over 25 years. We have nine storefronts in Rhode Island. We operate in 23 states. We're the parent company to Advance America. We have a long history of working with Rhode Island consumers and the legislature to try to establish appropriate consumer protections balanced with access to credit for our consumers. Our company's mission is to help consumers uh, achieve their vision of financial stability now and in the future. We try to make our solutions accessible, simple, straightforward, so that our customers have the tools and resources they need to succeed. A little bit about our customers. They are hardworking Rhode Islanders. They have jobs. They are average 49 years old. Average monthly income is $3,400. 48% of them own their homes and they uh, appreciate our products and services. We get a, a 4.97 rating out of five on Google reviews. Our product is a, a fee-based product. It does not exceed 10% of the amount advanced on a 10, or $10 per hundred on the loan. The maximum loan amount is $450. It's va the value for our customers is uh, they consider the options of bouncing checks of paying late fees or of having uh, missed payments altogether. We know there, there are some credit unions and religious and nonprofit organizations that provide limited credit services. Unfortunately, those services are not widely available and offer required waiting periods or have strings attached. And many are subsidized through charitable contributions. In conclusion, the impact of House Bill 7211 would be to eliminate a licensed, regulated, credit source and provide no real viable alternative for Rhode Islanders. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none. Oh, Representative Phillips. I just have one quick question. Now, it's considered payday loans, uh, and there's somebody in the audience, and I, she and I have had many discussions. The length of term, is it two weeks, a week, month, two months? What is the loan? It was typically until your next payday. So some of our customers are on 30-day loans, and some of them are two weeks. So it's and it's, it's ten dollars per hundred terms. for what that for the one term month of the loan. or for the term for the so, term of the loan. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. 
Move to the next witness. I wrote mine because I'm clergy and it could be longer. Uh, I'm hopeful that, that A, you hear this because it, I hope it will give you background for other bills that come before you and not just this one. <clears throat> Some people might wonder why you're letting clergy speak when it's around finances. For many people today, religion is just a superstitious belief in a mythical, understand, not real figure called God. The various religions, sacred, sacred books have and some ex exemplary people, nice stories, and some good ethical teachings, but also some very violent, harsh, exclusionary people, stories and teachings as well. Some think it is time to throw the whole religion thing out. 700 years after the beginning of the age of reason, what most people do not know or never thought about or were never taught is that religions are more than just stories about God. Religion was and is still, to some extent, science. The various religious traditions grew out of humanity's questions about how and why. As people began, began to think about how and why things happen, they developed theories, scientific theories. Today, we think of them as quaint stories of creation, as well as other stories about weather, fertility, agriculture, etc. <clears throat> when these stories were told and later written, they were not stories in our modern sense. They were scientific <coughs> facts. Religions dealt with more than the facts of physical science. They also covered the realm of health, government, and social cohesion. Religions help to structure and maintain whole groups of people and ultimately whole nations. As a footnote here, it is interesting to see very early on in the development of Judaism, the establishment of three branches of government we know today. Biblically, the king, the priests, and the prophets correspond perfectly with the executive, legislative, and judicial branches. In my personal faith journey, I, like many people, struggled with much of what appeared to be random harshness and violent tendencies, especially in the Hebrew scriptures. One of the things that bothered me were the laws about punishment by stoning. For small fractions around unimportant laws, people were either pushed out of the group, which meant death in the wilderness, or were stoned to death. How could people be so cruel was my thinking. But then, then one day enlightenment struck me. If the people of Israel were to survive in the wilderness, they must follow the rules. They must stick together. And eventually, or eventually, all would die, either separately or together. The individual who broke the law was endangering the whole group. It was either the death of the person who broke the law or the death of everybody, the whole group, or nation. The purpose of the Torah the books of the Jewish law was the very survival of the Hebrew people. To break the law, to ignore the law, to not follow the law was a guarantee of the destruction of the nation. Scientific fact. To, not, do you support the bill? I do. Okay. But, <laughs> All right. Can I? Okay, so I think you should probably go to if there's any questions. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none. All right. I mean, if you want to wrap it up in uh, the two sentences, but, you know, we do have. All right. Two sentences. The clergy in two sentences. Uh, the, the most important the reality, two sentences. The reality of is that usury and anything, I want, it, I want 0%. Christianity, Islam, and Judaism recommend 0%. But 36% is what I'm willing to compromise. But it is for the health of the nation. And when you break those laws, you ruin your nation. And I know this is a small thing compared to the bombs going off around the world. But it is affecting individuals, and we're hurting individuals. And for the health of the nation, we've got to cap interest rates. Thank you. We'll go to the next witness. You're worried about questions? I won't. I'll Thank you. Hello again, Chairman Solomon, members of the committee. Again, my name is Alan Krinsky, I'm Director of Research and Fiscal Policy at the Economic Progress Institute, and I'm testifying in strong support of Representative Alzate's H7211. I first want to begin by applauding this committee for sending last year's version of this legislation to the House floor. It received a historic bipartisan, as Rep. Alzate said, tripartisan vote of 70 to 2 in favor of passage. 
Um, second, I want to make clear that this legislation does not ban payday lending storefronts. It simply removes the special carve-out that enables them to charge 260% annual percentage rate of interest. And it's, it's not the 10%. I think even if you look at, say, the Advance America documentation and the fine print, they have to recognize that it's 260% APR. Um, and so this would just say, you're welcome to stay open. You just have to play by the same rules that other small loan lenders like banks and credit unions in the state have to play by instead of being able to charge 260%. Um, third, we've been at this, or not just not me, but for, for 13, 14 years or so, and I think you know, there, there should be a sense of, of urgency. I think if, if it was brought before you that there were predatory lenders, particularly, say, targeting small business owners with triple-digit interest rates, that you and your colleagues and the General Assembly would act very quickly to stop that. But with this targeted at low and modest income Rhode Islanders, there isn't always as much of um, the urgency. Fourth, I just want to be clear that the payday lenders are not offering credit to those in need. Some credit unions and banks that we heard do offer such credit non predatory rates, but the payday lenders are instead offering entry to a cycle of debt, and the profit model of the business is based upon repeated borrowing. If everyone took out one loan, paid it back right away, the, the business would close down because the profit model doesn't work that way. So what I want to end with is urging you, I really already took a vote to, to hold for further study on all the bills, and I'm not sure if you have the quorum, but I would urge you, um, not only to send this legislation to the full House, but to do so today or very soon, to not hold the legislation further study. Based on last year's vote, we can be confident it will pass again, and doing so now would shift the focus to the Senate, which last year did not hold even a hearing, let alone a vote on the companion bill. So let's not wait until you know, June to, to send this to the floor and to shift the burden to the Senate. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you all for your testimony. Sorry, no, no, it's right. I'm sorry, and your, your last name? Because I might. Sterrick. It's I, I, Sterrick. I a okay. Over there. So we have William Staterman. We have Margo, Margo Morisot. And while you're both coming up to the front, uh, there were a bunch of people who signed up on this bill not testifying, so we have Joe Rubin signed up against, Jack Mazzara signed up in favor, Kate McGovern signed up in favor, Rebecca Garretts signed up in favor, Mary Barden signed up in favor, Matt Netto signed up in favor, George Nee signed up in favor, James Diosa signed up in favor, Steve Alves and Bob Jacquard signed up against from Upstart. Uh, Michael Dumond signed up in favor. Steve Alquist signed up in favor. And Kathleen Gerard signed up in favor. All right, so. Um, All right, go ahead, ladies first. <laughs> okay. Welcome back. Thank you so much, Chairman Solomon, and thank you to members of the committee for hearing our, our bill. Um, I am, representing um, myself today as a concerned citizen. I'm not being paid to be here, um, and I'm not representing an organization. I have been against the predatory practices of payday lending since I first learned about this practice, and have been trying very hard to change it uh, now for 14 years. Um, I am in full support of Representative Karen Alzate's bill, um, and I urge you to take a decisive action to protect individuals and communities from the harmful effects of predatory lending and curb the 260% APR um, that they're currently charging in our state. I really do not feel that 36% APR should be something so difficult to ask for. Um, this bill has been heard for many years, and I do commend the House for passing this legislation in 2023 with an overwhelming majority of 70 to 2 we hope that you'll pass it quickly again this year so that we can focus our energy on the Senate. You have heard me talk about the is issue for a long time, so I'll save you the description of the practice and how harmful it is to our neighbors, our communities, and our state, and how much money is drained out of our economy because of this ridiculous APR. I can tell you that I continue to hear horror stories of how people's financial stability have been decimated by these loans. 
I have recently spoken to a woman whose marriage was suffering because of the financial strain payday loans had put on her relationship. Families are suffering because of these things. Children are suffering because of these things. While we continue to address the, pr the problem by education, community outreach, and promoting alternative products, we have had some exciting updates to share. Three cities in Rhode Island have passed ordinances to curb and regulate this predatory practice, Winsocket, Cranston, and Providence. And I will continue to work with cities and towns who are interested in, pay in predatory lending reform. Nationally, Senator Reed is making strides and pushing hard to cap the interest rate at 36% as well. But being an outlier in the Northeast, Rhode Island is ready for this reform. We hope that the influence of high-paid lobbyists and political inside baseball doesn't hold this piece of good legislation from becoming law this year. It's time to act. And with overwhelming support from voters, elected officials, and statewide office holders, it's time for the General Assembly to pass legislation to curb the predatory rates at a more than reasonable rate. I urge you to take decisive action and rein in this predatory uh, industry and pass H7211. And I thank you for your attention to this critical issue. Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none, go to the next okay. witness. Well, let's start off with a few explanations. Killing the payday lending industry in the state of Rhode Island will do nothing to help the large numbers of Rhode Islanders who turn to short-term loans to make ends meet. As an example, you have to drive to work every day. You only get paid every two weeks. All of a sudden, something happens to your automobile and you have to get it fixed so that you can go to work. As long as you are over 18 years old, you have a job, and you have a bank account, you can go to a payday lender and say, look, I need $235 to get this car fixed because that's what they want. That's the average price or the amount of money that people borrow is about $235 when you add them all up, $235. So you'll be able to pay for that and you'll get it right away immediately and you're able to get your car fixed so you can go back to work, okay? Some of the things that also happen along the same line, which indicates why payday lending, and is not predatory lending, it's called payday, P-A-Y-D-A. -A. You want to spell that, right? What happens is when you take a look at some of the things, for instance, that are happening right now, there are several different companies, and I think um, Walgreen, Walmart has one there where if you work every day, let's say you work eight hours today, and you get paid $10 an hour, that would be $80, but it's gonna take a couple of weeks before you receive that. Now, you can go into places, which I believe the Walmart does, and there are companies that will do it, and they will give you that $80 and put it right in your bank through Zelle, if you're familiar with what Zelle is, that can put the money just like that into your bank account. Of course, you have to pay a little bit for it, though, but this is a big thing that's coming more and more because people don't want to wait, have to wait two weeks to be able to get the money. Some of the things that are interesting about it is, for instance, the, man, the demand for the payday type of loans will remain. They won't go away. The only thing the bill before us will change is who people will be able to get these loans from. Residents would be forced to turn to unregulated online or offshore lenders, perhaps even their neighborhood loan shop. In the Providence Business News, September of 2023, not too long ago, an article states that a westerly woman needed money and took out a payday loan. It said a payday loan, that's what it said in there. And I'm reading exactly what was in there. She signed a contract with the company. Her initial loan was for $1,800, and she would have to pay back $3,000. This could not have been a licensed payday lender. Rhode Island licensed payday lenders can only provide a maximum loan of 500, the reason why it's all done with 450 is because if you charge, if you, if you were to 
give somebody $500 and charge 10%, that'd be another $50, so it'd be over the total amount, and that's why it's laid out at 450 as the most. Okay, so it could not have been a licensed payday lender, but yet it was in the article. Rhode Island licensed payday lenders can only provide a maximum loan of the 450. Obviously, this incident was not provided by a licensed Rhode Island payday lender. It showed that this is the kind of lenders that will increase if there are no more licensed payday lenders. Payday lending is a very simple thing. It's a small amount. The number of complaints to the Rhode Island state government is less than 20 people almost every year. The other side of it is, it's called 241%. Well, that's correct if you're charging 10% at the beginning. However, you're not taking the loan for a year. It would be the same thing as if a friend of yours said, oh, listen, it's a Sunday afternoon and I need $100. Can you loan me the $100 and I'll, I'll, I'll give it back to you tomorrow, okay? And you say, okay, here's $100, but tomorrow when you come back with the cash, give me a dollar with it, be $101. If you use the same type of thing that people do with the payday lending, that is an amount of 365%, <laughs> okay? So the whole idea is that people really like to have the payday loans, whether they want to or not, other things are coming up, other people are coming up with companies to make loans, whatever they can want to do. But the idea is, it's right there, it's quick, it just reminds me of kind of, let's say, a gas station that's right in the middle of some place, and if you need the gas, it's more expensive than some place that's way out or around where you can get to it. So the whole idea is there's no reason to do away with something like this for all of the people. People don't complain, and the people that operate the payday loans, the companies, there aren't that many. Some check cashers that used to do it stopped doing it. Why? because it gets too expensive when people don't pay back. And you're out of the money, so that's it. Are there any, any questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you both for your testimony here tonight. And that concludes the hearing on that bill. Thank you, nice mm -hmm. to see everybody and Chairman. <laughs> we know each other. <laughs> so next we have House Bill 7945 by Chairman McNamara. This bill would create the Occupational Therapy Licensure Compact that would allow licensed occupational therapists and occupational therapy assistants to practice in all states that join the compact. So we have Janet, of the, if you may, okay. We have Kim Gilbert. And while they're coming to the microphone, Kathleen Gerard signed up in favor, not testifying. And Robert Dulski signed up in favor, not testifying. And also Lisa Folies. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You're all from the same organization. I'll let you go in whichever order you prefer. Fantastic. Thank you, Chairman uh, Jim Solomon and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Janet Rivard Michaud. I'm an occupational therapist of 37 years, um, 34 here in my home state of Rhode Island, three in my sister state of Massachusetts. Um, I'm here today in a number of capacities. I'm a past uh, president of the Rhode Island OT Association, past member and chairperson of the Rhode Island Occupational Therapy Licensure Board, and today I'm here primarily as the advocacy chair for RIOTA, the Rhode Island Occupational Therapy Association, and speaking in that capacity. I'm also a private practitioner as well as an employee here in the state of Rhode Island. Um, it is my assumption that you guys have probably heard many, many compact bills and know the structure of them, so I don't want to belabor that with you. I have provided um, written testimony for you. Uh, the last page is sort of a this bill does, this bill doesn't kind of thing. So I thought what I would do is just take a very quick moment to just remind us all that healthcare is in the process of change, significant change. Our workforce supplies are very limited. We have people who are crossing borders to receive treatment, both in our sister communities and beyond. Um, we also have people who are, are having to work in more than one state, and that could be simply to make ends meet, or it could be because of the mergers that are happening and people are having to work in different um, uh, off-sites for their, their particular agency. So this bill is really about access, efficiency, 
and protection. Um, and that's kind of what I wanted to emphasize today with just a couple of examples. Um, I will also say there are some minor transcription errors in the bill. I have included those in my testimony. Do I need to bring them here or is that okay in the, the written? Uh, if, uh, have you provided them to the committee? Yes. Okay, then yes. that's all. Okay, no fantastic. Problem. So in regard to access, um, Rhode Island has a million ninety-six thousand uh, people here as per the U.S. Census of July 1, 2023. We only have 1,089 occupational therapists to service that number of people and 639 licensed occupational therapy assistants through our Rhode Island Department of um, Health website. That equates to one OT for every 1,006 people and one OTA for every 1,715. It's not a lot. We make up less 0.16 of the population in Rhode Island. So this would be wonderful to make it possible for people to come into the state more easily. Uh, it will not help our initial folks when they're getting their first license, but it will help in regard to the remainder. And that brings me to the efficiency aspect of the compact. With everything localized in a centralized database, it's a big contrast from what all of us experienced when we were getting our licenses. When I got my Massachusetts license, I had to take a day out of the work and spend the whole day there just to make the application. Then I had to wait weeks. Rhode Island was quite similar. Recently, I had a, a glitch with my mass license and I had to do a reinstatement because I was given some misinformation. It took eight weeks with assistance from the Rhode Island Department of Health's um, licensure board to make that happen. This system would allow a 15-minute turnaround. So all of this information is there. It's available. Obviously, we, there are some protections involved here um, in terms of you know, uh, background checks and things like that, which we completely support from the Rhode Island OT Association. Um, so that's, that's a wonderful thing. When people are moving to our state and they have quick turnaround times for opportunities, they really need to have a license walking in the door. So this would help us by having that mutual recognition pr uh, privilege. So that's the efficiency. Um, protection for the public, having served on the licensure board, there were many times when people presented to us with, with minor and or not minor issues, and we had to reach out to other states to get information. To have that in a centralized database, if there's an investigation going on, just helps the process. Sometimes it may mean that a provider isn't waiting months, panicked about something that's very minor that we could ease their mind with. Or it means if someone, and it's very rare in occupational therapy, but if there was something egregious that was done, that could get nipped in the bud and everybody would be aware of it so that it would be safer for people. So there's the protection for the public. The final thing that I want to mention, as I did in the Senate hearing, is um, I'm a lifelong Rhode Islander. I know how fiercely independent we all are. I know how much we don't like to be told what to do. This compact will not change anything that we currently do in the state. Our statutes stand, our rules and regs stand, our ability to discipline practitioners as needed also stands. So all of those things I think are provided for in here and I'll, I'll leave it at that and let anybody has questions. Thank you. Go to the next witness. Kim Gilbert, I'm the immediate past president of the Rhode Island Occupational Therapy Association. I've been an OT for 47 years. I currently hold a license in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Necessary when I'm providing home care, or when I did work in skilled nursing facilities that had facilities across the border. It's a very common thing. I want to speak today as a small business owner. I have a tiny private practice since 1997, and I employ occupational therapists and assistants who work in the schools. And with a very tight job market right now, if I would like to offer someone a job, I need to know that they have a license, you know, an active license or can get one in a week. And to think that someone from Massachusetts or Connecticut might need to wait two months through no one's fault, but just the way that things go, to be able to accept a job is problematic. Uh, and it has occurred in the past once or twice. So while we don't have the compact in place yet, if we are allowed to move forward with this, and Massachusetts is working on it, and I'm sure Connecticut's not far behind us, this kind of thing is a great boon to the small business, and I thank you. Thank you. And next witness. It, this, the red button has to be up. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lise Felice. Um, I am an occupational therapist, and I am the pediatric chair of the Rhode Island OT Association. And I am also a small business owner, and I work in the school system. So my points that are different uh, 
talk a little bit about the need to fill positions in a short turnaround kind of time. So pediatric therapists particularly work in school systems during the school year. And so when those towns post on SchoolSpring or their other uh, websites a need for a position, and there is a very short uh, workforce right now, it's, the turnaround time is essential in order to get therapists in the door in those positions in September. Um, in a lot of cases, you also have maternity leaves, so being able to figure out how to cover maternity leaves, hi hiring people in a short period of time. And then the other piece um, that I think is really important is you have um, families that you start to work with and bond and develop relationships with, and so the continuity of care also becomes an issue, and we have a lot of seasonal employers um, and seasonal workers in this state, and so you have people migrating from towns to towns and across borders, and in order to be that continuity, that offer that continuity in your therapy, to follow that family, you need, if you're going to do teletherapy or therapy across lines, you need a license in that state. So in order to serve these underserved populations, a lot of the kids that do migrate are some of the neediest. So it's very important to offer some continuity so it's not like a family's picking up and getting to know a new therapist and trying to reattach to services as soon as they move. So there's a, an importance in terms of serving the neediest population. And then um, I think the other piece that's really important is that the compact is currently uh, been accepted in 28 other states, and I believe that there's a lot of um, support for this. Many other states are in process now. In fact, I don't even know the number. I think it's so large. Seven Maybe Janet, more. seven more. Um, so I, I believe that New England is all in. Um, we are one of the last states in Connecticut, um, but I in Massachusetts in the, is in the process as well. So it would certainly serve us well if we took this step, and I urge you to support this. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for the witnesses? Representative Phillips. Thank you. We've been hearing a lot of licensure compact bills this year. Seems like a little bit more than normal. So how dire is the lack of employees or a lack of uh, therapists in the state here? I think it depends on what area of practice you're in. Our nursing homes are certainly bereft, as they have been in, with nursing in every other area of, of practice. So I think OT is being hit in the same way. We do have three schools here in Rhode Island that helps us a little bit. Um, and we do have people who kind of come across the border from nearby Attleboro and, and Seekonk and Swansea. But um, when, I, when I shared those numbers earlier, one to like 1,700 out of a million plus people, that's a really small number. So, you know, we may not even have a sense of the gravity of how much we're missing because we're not servicing those people, right? I can tell you on my own personal caseload, I can have people wait two, three months before they can get in to see me, which is a very long time and not at all what I want to see happen. And, that's, and I'm not the only one. I hear that from our colleagues in other professions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. And, um, you know, I would just recommend reaching out to the Department of Health as well because we have had a lot of compact bills and I noticed that the Department of Health sent a letter with some concerns. So I'd you know, recommend reaching out to them, reading the letter, reaching out to them. I'm not sure whether their concerns are valid. Mm -hmm. but, we actually yeah. did meet with the Occupational Therapy Licensure Board and answered some questions for them. I didn't realize there were additional concerns, so that, that's, with I will do that. With Thank financial you. To, you know, implementation and stuff. I see. So, so I, were they... Can, were they concerned, um, Rep, about the um, the cost of like building a new system? Is that where that came from? Because I each... think that's part of it. So uh, we can provide you with a copy, or it, it's I would on, love that. It's online as well, too. Right, because we certainly want to be receptive to any concerns that are up there. Um, what I can tell you is that it, this was not meant to be a burdensome financial issue for states. Mm -hmm. It was meant to really make it easier, and states will retain the, the right to charge a fee for any compact. It's not like you just go on and then you get it for free. You know, they, they still right. can do that, so it may attract more money into Rhode Island, in fact. Well, thank you all for your testimony, and thank you for your thank patience you. tonight. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. And that concludes the hearing on that bill. Last, we have House Bill 7939 by Representative Mazalikowski.
This is the would require retailers of glucose monitors to provide a free point of sale replacement for any broken or defective monitor within 24 hours of the request. Janine Calkin signed up in favor, not testifying. And that concludes the hearing on House Bill 7939. And with that, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion seconded. Seconded. We are adjourned. Thank you.